So the uh, title of the talk today is Communicating Truth in Love, which is a quotation taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 15. Now, if we think of the invention of the printing press and of mass-produced literature in the 16th century, that was a catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. And that period could be seen as a word-based battle of ideas. In the 16th century, images were banished from the churches, and the focus was on the spoken word that was often delivered in whitewashed interiors. Now, this seems reasonable if we consider that, after all, for us Christians, we say that the word became flesh, and therefore we should concentrate on the word, the spoken word. And yet, the whole point of our incarnational faith is that the word became flesh. Therefore, the Catholic Reformation rightly responded with all that delighted the whole human person in the flesh, all that delights the body with art and beauty, liturgy and song, and the splendor of architecture that we call the Baroque. But this, all this splendor and beauty would have been mere vanity were it not accompanied or even preceded by moral beauty and holiness. And this is the pattern that I want to suggest for us to always hold in mind when we talk about communicating the truth in love. It's a pattern that was set over a millennium before the Counter-Reformation, for example, here in the country I'm living in, in England, when Pope St. Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine of Canterbury to England as a missionary from Rome. In the year 597, St. Augustine came to these shores and we're told by the Venerable Bede that he was furnished with divine virtue. He bore a silver cross for, her, for their banner and also the image of our Lord and Savior painted on a board. In other words, he carried also an icon of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, we learn that St. Augustine evangelized England with art represented by the icon of Christ, with the truth of the Catholic faith represented by the cross and with beauty made visible by his own life of virtue, the beauty of holiness. So therefore these three must, I, I believe, always be communicated if we're going to communicate well, particularly as Catholics. Hence, the figure that is held out for our emulation as communicators of Catholic truth and as journalists and as people involved in social media and other forms of digital communications today, the figure held out for us is a saint who lived in the post-Reformation world and who was involved in the battle of ideas that marked that age, but who won over his interlocutors because of his own personal holiness and particularly his courtesy. Thus, St. Francis de Sales is highlighted by Pope Francis in his message for World Communications Day 2023. And he reminds us that this year is also the 100th anniversary of St. Francis de Sales having been declared the patron saint of journalists. Pope Francis says, therefore, Francis de Sales was Bishop of Geneva at the beginning of the 17th century during difficult years marked by heated disputes with Calvinists. His meek attitude, humanity, and willingness to dialogue patiently with everyone, especially with those who disagreed with him, made him an extraordinary witness of God's merciful love. This willingness to dialogue is found in the best of saints. It's rooted in a certain humble confidence in the perennial truth of the Catholic faith. The mistake people often make is to think that certitude is, is also is, is, uh, equated with arrogance. But as St. Paul says, what we have here, what we have as the truth that we believe in is not something that we have made for ourselves, but something that we have received, something that has been handed on to us. And so we receive it with humility. The gospel is not our own personal message, but it's something that we have received and we receive with humility. The saints, therefore, are confident that they have received saving truth from Christ, the incarnate word himself, a truth which is handed on faithfully 
by his church, which is the body of Christ on earth. Hence, Christians today should not fear opposing ideas or questions or objections. I think, for example, of St. Thomas Aquinas and the didactic method of the medieval universities of Europe, in which many disputed questions and controversies were given due attention by listing the objections against a particular position, and then each objection is patiently answered. St. Thomas Aquinas in particular entered into dialogue with pagan philosophers such as Aristotle and Muslim thinkers like Averroes, and he was not afraid to use the methods and truths discovered by Aristotle because he was confident of the unity of truth, which resides in God and which leads to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, as we know, faith and reason are not in contradiction, but in fact work together like two wings that lead us to the ultimate truth, who is God. This kind of faith and confidence in the ability of the intellect to apprehend the truth, to reason well, and to know the truth, this faith and confidence must surely animate our dialogue today. And I want presently in this uh, short talk to present, uh, to draw on the example of St. Francis de Sales to very briefly illustrate how he did this. St. Francis de Sales also happens to be one of my favorite saints because he wrote so wisely about the spiritual life, about devotion, which is to say love for God. And he often illustrated his writings with very beautiful and vivid examples, very charming examples really, drawn from the beauty of the natural world. If you've not read his book, Introduction to the Devout Life, I would commend it to you. Now, the obstacles to a fruitful communication of the gospel, precisely understood as good news, which is what gospel means, of course. Now, these obstacles are highlighted for us by Pope Francis in his message this year. The Holy Father speaks of the need to, I quote, overcome the vague din, which also in the field of information does not help us discern in the complicated world in which we live. The call to speak with the heart radically challenges the times in which we are living, which are so inclined towards indifference and indignation, at times even on the basis of disinformation, which falsifies and exploits the truth. Broadly speaking, the Holy Father is talking about agenda-driven fake news. He's talking about avoiding the sensational and the combative that seeks to sell our story rather than seek and tell the truth with courage and freedom and honesty. The Holy Father's concerns that she articulates in this year's message are nothing new for him. He has spoken about it at some length in his encyclicals Fratelli Tutti and Laudato Si. Many of us probably think that Laudato Si is simply about the environment. But did you notice that the Pope is also concerned about the social environment in which we live and work and communicate? And so in that encyclical, he is especially concerned about the internet. This is right, because just as printing revolutionized the 16th century and 15th centuries and fueled the Reformation, we are now currently in our time in the maelstrom of an even greater revolution thanks to the internet. The Pontifical Council for Culture has called this a cultural revolution but the worry is that it is leading to, well, what I might call a culture of stupidity. Let me explain. In his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis says that when media and the digital world become omnipresent, their influence can stop people from learning how to live wisely. It can stop people from thinking deeply and from loving generously. Now, each of these assertions that the media and digital world can stop us from living wisely, thinking deeply and loving generously, each of these assertions, these three, needs to be considered. We also need to consider what are the vices that endanger us personally and as communicators and which endanger our culture and society. And finally, how can we counteract these negative influences? How can St. Francis de Sales help
help us as Christian communicators and evangelizers. Firstly, the Pope says that the influence of a pervasive digital media can stop people from learning how to live wisely. Why? What are the conditions for and the goals of learning? What is needed if we're to live wisely? St. Thomas Aquinas, the great Dominican uh, universal doctor of the church, would say that the human person is created with a rational nature in order that he might know the truth and love the good, who is ultimately God. For all creatures are inclined towards God, who is their cause. Our human learning, therefore, must discern the truth, seek the good, and ultimately direct us towards God, who alone satisfies the needs and the demands of our intellectual nature. Learning truth through a rational act, indeed, becomes, in a sense, a divinizing act, in that it actualizes understanding of the truth within us. As St. Thomas says in the Summa Contra Gentiles, a thing inclines toward the divine likeness as to its own end. Now, an intellectual creature chiefly becomes like God by the fact that it is intellectual, for it has this sort of likeness over and above what other creatures have. In the genus of this sort of likeness, a being becomes more like God by actually understanding than by habitually or potentially understanding, because God is always actually understanding. I guess pause there for a moment because there's quite a lot to take in, but that's a, and, and I can hear Singaporeans will go, that's cheem, right? But that is a uh, phenomenally Dominican thing to say, what St. Thomas has just said. God is an active or actualized intellect, right? He is understanding itself. He is truth and knowledge itself. And so the more we truly understand or we actually understand, and the more that we, uh, in other words, the more that we're actively thinking and trying to understand things, the more we become like God, okay? This is opposed to what he calls habitual or potential understanding. Potential understanding is sort of like a passive understanding of things and it's not really, um, so you're not really actively working it out. And um, habitual is just um, things that we do uh, without thinking like, like, I don't know, driving a car or, or I don't know, cooking or something. We're, we're not really thinking, we're just going through the, this is something we've learned habitually. It's already part of what we know, okay? So that's, the intellect is not actively engaged. But so, for example, when you're sitting, uh, remember as a kid and you're doing a math exercise and you're trying to work it out, you get really, or I get really agitated when I can't quite figure it out, or I'm reading some difficult philosophy and I'm trying to understand. When the active intellect is engaged, uh, then we are actually becoming more like God. Dominicans are brainiacs, so that's the kind of way they talk and they think. Um, it's a very, I always find it amusing to read St. Thomas talk like that. Anyway. But if you think about it, okay, it, active intelligence, actually knowing things uh, and working things out is important. What does the internet do? It dulls your brains. It even dulls your memory, right? So the internet, insofar as it is a repository of knowledge and a source of information, yes, it is valuable as an instrument for teaching, for actualizing our understanding just as books and libraries are instrumental in actualizing understanding. But two things can hinder the potential learner. Firstly, as Pope Francis says, the internet confronts us with the noise and distractions of an information overload. And moreover, he says, there is the mere accumulation of data, which eventually leads to overload and confusion a sort of mental pollution, Pope Francis says. The problem, however, is not necessarily with the amount of information online, nor the competing neutrality of information as such. Rather, what hinders learning is the lack of a teacher or the lack of an editor to help learners evaluate the quality of the information online and to reduce the confusion so that the truth becomes clearer. Thus, in 2020, Pope Francis returned to this theme in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, saying, 
The flood of information at our fingertips does not make for greater wisdom. Wisdom is not born of quick searches on the internet, nor is it a mass of unverified data. Now, one of the strengths of the internet when it was created was its democracy and egalitarianism. Anybody could create content and publish it online. And many of us, I'm sure, know that and we've benefited from this. Hence, the, intellect, in the internet has long been wary of censorship or regulations that would restrict this freedom. However, that's all very well and fine if human beings can be uh, relied upon to use their freedom in a responsible way, but we can't. Therefore, a kind of freedom of indifference that has been pertaining until now with regard to digital content has led to the proliferation of vice and of problems that affect the real world. Interestingly, the Dominican Swiss moral theologian, Father Service Pinkers says that, and I quote, freedom of indifference was impregnated with a secret passion for self-affirmation. Okay, freedom of indifference was impregnated with a secret passion for self-affirmation. Freedom, freedom of indifference means that um, there are no such things as uh, good and bad. Everything is morally neutral and we're indifferent towards the morality of it, everything. So uh, it's, it's what you make of it that makes it good or bad, okay? Um, and this kind of indifference, moral indifference seems to permeate throughout the internet. You just put everything up there. Uh, there's no one to edit or say, this is not, uh, this is not good for you morally. So uh, you have to decide for yourself. It's called freedom of indifference. And the result is that as the internet has developed, we certainly see today evidence of this not so secret passion in our, in our selfie saturated use of social media. So there's a certain, there's a passion for self-affirmation and it becoming very, very evident, right? Likewise, the initial freedom of the internet, which was meant to be self-regulated, did not recognize that man has a history of using our freedom for bad ends, as I said. But people like Tim Berners-Lee, do you know who Tim Berners-Lee is? He is the, the British uh, scientist who invented the internet. Uh, and Tim Berners-Lee now recognizes that the Eden-like initial freedom of the internet might now need to be curtailed in some fashion so as to avoid the sins of the age. So for example, in uh, November, 2018, he was interviewed and he said, for many years, there was a feeling that the wonderful things on the web were going to dominate and we'd have a world with less conflict, more understanding, more and better science and good democracy. But instead he said, humanity connected by technology on the web is functioning in a dystopian way. We have online abuse, prejudice, bias, polarization, fake news. There are lots of ways in which it is broken. His response has been to encourage a social contract among web users and particularly among the powerful global corporations that effectively control the flow of information online. However, as Berners-Lee admits, the genie may seem to have come out of the bottle. Sin doesn't stop without repentance. And for this to happen, it seems to me one needs ultimately to look to an authority outside of ourselves. We look to God, therefore, to Christ the teacher, to receive from him a more robust determination of the true and of the good. Incidentally, just uh, yesterday, I was reading about artificial intelligence. And the inventors of artificial intelligence have themselves been shocked at how quickly this has grown. Uh, and they have now said there should be a pause on research into artificial intelligence and some uh, restrictions and censorships as it were put into place to direct uh, AI towards the good because they can see, and this is a pattern we've seen over and over again, that whenever this new digital technology develops, um, People with bad intentions, with malicious intent, uh, will take hold of it and exploit it and use it for their for their evil ends. So there needs to be something to that will constrain this. So, if we're to learn to live wisely, as Pope Francis indicates we should, then we need the guidance of a knowledgeable and a trustworthy teacher, one who knows the true and the good, one who is wise 
and who can thus help direct others who are unwise towards these transcendent ends of the true and the good. Now, we can learn in two ways. We learn internally through the light of natural reason by which we can reason syllogistically and move from things that we know to new conclusions. But at the same time, we need a teacher, a source of superior knowledge external to us who leads us to reason well and to share in his knowledge. Hence, given the mass of information online, there is a need for convinced and convincing teachers of Christian truth, like Bishop Robert Barron, for example, who can engage learners and seekers online, who can answer contemporary questions by drawing on the deep wells of wisdom in our Christian thought. And I think also of some of the very good work that your, you guys are doing in your Singapore uh, Archdiocese communications team. Uh, I've looked at some of the materials. I've seen, of course, the preaching and the materials that the Archbishop himself puts out in Singapore. And I think it can be widely recognized that these are good sources of wisdom. The problem, of course, as always, is how to get people to listen and view this stuff and to engage with it, right? Nevertheless, our Holy Father encourages us, Pope Francis says, efforts need to be made to help these media become sources of new cultural progress for humanity and not a threat to our deepest riches. However, the plethora of information online and the ease of obtaining it can easily give rise to the vice of curiositas. So we need to be aware of it, to be aware of curiositas. What is it? It sounds a bit like curiosity. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas says that curiositas is the pursuit of knowledge of the truth, which is good in itself, but it can be done for sinful intentions or done in the wrong way. For example, he says, some can study to know the truth in order that they might take pride in their knowledge. Their knowledge then is used to dominate and belittle others, or even in order to sin. For example, one can learn how to make a bomb or study law so as to learn to evade the law. However, the internet can also distract us from the proper goal of study. St. Thomas cites St. Jerome who gives this example. He said, St. Jerome said this, okay, this is already in the fifth century. We see priests forsaking the gospels and the prophets, reading stage plays and singing the love songs of pastoral idyls. In other words, it's like reading cheap novels and singing, uh, what's it called, boy band romance songs or something, okay? There's also the learning of occult or superstitious knowledge, which is sinful. And the vice of curiositas also includes learning about creatures for their own sake without any reference to God. So St. Thomas says that man's good consists in the knowledge of truth, yet man's sovereign good consists not in the knowledge of any truth, but in the perfect knowledge of the sovereign truth. Hence, they may sin in the knowledge of certain truths, insofar as the desire of such knowledge is not directed in due manner to the knowledge of the sovereign truth, wherein supreme happiness consists. In other words, it's fine to study all kinds of things and to want to seek the truth, but all those truths are directed towards increasing our knowledge and love for the creator of all these things. Interesting, how many of us study like that? Interestingly, curiositas also involves a kind of intellectual pride, whereby a man studies to know the truth above the capacity of his own intelligence, since by doing so, uh, by so doing, men easily fall into error. In other words, St. Thomas seems to think that um, sometimes we can study things that uh, at a level that's beyond our own capacities and what we're actually capable of. Uh, and, and that would be a problem as well. And the final objection to this question uh, of St. Thomas's is especially relevant. There can be a tendency to think indifferently that all intellectual knowledge is desirable, and so we should have a certain academic freedom to study and research whatever we fancy. The internet seems to indifferently lay open the whole world of ideas as our proverbial oyster to enjoy. However, St. Thomas observes that 
The study of philosophy is in itself lawful and commendable, but certain philosophers misuse the truth in order to assail the faith. The study of these thinkers would, it seems, be giving into the vice of curiositas. The goal, therefore, is to direct all our learning towards God and cultivate the virtue of studiositas. Studiousness concerns then the acquisition of knowledge in a moderate way that doesn't give in to inordinate curiosities nor to the avoidance of the hard work necessary for study. And among the necessary conditions for a studious intellectual life, uh, the Dominican, uh, from the French Dominican, Sir Tillange, recommends silence, solitude, and a certain austerity and detachment. Broadly speaking, he's talking about the kind of contemplative life that he experienced as a Dominican. I can't say it exists all the time nowadays in Dominican life. Nevertheless, the omnipresent digital world, as Pope Francis notes, militates against this kind of studiositas, where there's detachment, silence, and solitude because of the mental pollution that the Pope points out. This is why Pope Benedict XVI, in his message for World Communications Day in 2012, said that when messages and information are plentiful, silence becomes essential if we are to distinguish what is important from what is insignificant and secondary. Now, you might wonder to yourself, why am I going on and on about these vices and virtues uh, in regard to gathering information? It's because as communicators, one of the first things we do in order to communicate it well is to gather the information. And how do we gather the information? We must learn to discern what is true and what is right. And we must be able to actively understand what we're gathering so that we can then communicate what we have gathered, correct? Uh, in the Dominican way of putting it, we must first contemplate and then hand on the fruits of our contemplation. Whereas if we're just looking on Wikipedia and blindly copying all kinds of stuff and sticking it all in, well, then you get the kind of journalism that we see all over the world today. Now, uh, what time is it? Oh dear. Uh, this is an important part. So this is some really interesting research. So I will share it with you. Studiousness, silence, and some kind of detachment. These lead to deeper reflective thinking. As Pope Benedict has said, search engines and social networks have become the starting point of communication for many people who are seeking advice, ideas, information, and answers. In our time, the internet is becoming ever more a forum for questions and answers. Indeed, people today are frequently bombarded with answers to questions they have never asked and to needs of which they are unaware. If we are to recognize and focus upon the truly important questions then, silence is a precious commodity that enables us to exercise proper discernment in the face of the surcharge of stimuli and data that we receive. Silence and studiositas, therefore, would go a, deep, a long way towards countering the impact of the digital world. Some people you'll see in Catholic circles do a fast from social media during Lent. It's a very good thing to do. It's a very um, laudable um, Catholic instinct, I think, to actually fast and seek some silence and separation from all this bombardment of communications. There's a landmark book that uh, I would recommend by Nicholas Carr, Nicholas C-A-R-R. -R. The book is called The Shallows. Perhaps you've seen it yourself. And in this book, uh, he talks about how the internet is organized uh, and used by the mind and how it actually rewires our brains and how we think. For example, he says that the internet is like a large library of information that we can access. But he says the more we rely on this, the more the net diminishes what Samuel Johnson called the primary kind of knowledge, the ability to know in depth a subject for ourselves, to construct within our minds the rich and idiosyncratic set of connections that give rise to a singular intelligence. Instead, as we rely on Google to search and make the connections and on Facebook to store our memories and contacts, then deep thinking is also being affected by an overstimulated brain. 
The internet, you see, relies on us constantly clicking and engaging with it. So we're sent notifications and alerts and countless distractions, even though apps do try and stop this from happening. According to scientific research, the brain concentrates on decision-making, whether or not to click a link. And so it is overtaxed by this constant request for you to make a decision. Nicholas Carr claims that research shows that this impedes comprehension and retention as we become mere decoders of information, such that our ability to make the rich mental connections that form when we read deeply and without distraction remains largely disengaged. Moreover, as our brains become used to being distracted, we become less accustomed or even able to focus on an intellectual argument or to think deeply. Just think of how many people, uh, I don't know if you've seen it in Singapore, but I've seen it here, they are watching a movie in the cinema and they are distracted. They cannot focus on the story and the movie. So in halfway through the movie or partway through the movie, they start playing with their phones. They are not able to engage even with a movie, let alone with a book, okay? Carr says, Nicholas Carr says, as people's minds become attuned to the crazy quilts of web content, media companies have to adapt to the audience's new expectations so that information is now conveyed in fragments. As Tyler Cohen, an economist says, when access to information is easy, we tend to favor the short, the sweet, and the bitty. And this is lethal to reason discussion and deep thinking. This is partly why I'm a huge opponent of internet memes, and I don't like Catholic truths being communicated through memes. Um, and I think that I've seen some of the clever little videos that you do, the little TikToks that last a minute. Um, they're little skits. They're great for catching your attention. But uh, do we actually grab hold of people's attention? And if we do, what do we do with that attention? How can we deepen their thinking? This is a really difficult issue, okay, but a very real one that we need to grapple with. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas says that on the part of his bodily nature, man is inclined to avoid the trouble of seeking knowledge. Okay, so basically Thomas says, because of the body, our bodies and the way we are as human people, we just don't like thinking and we don't like bothering with learning things. It's too much hard work. Hence, the internet facilitates our slothful inclination towards easy, bite-sized information. The, the virtue of studiositas, however, helps to remove this obstacle to proper learning. How is it fostered? How is studiositas to be fostered? Firstly, through the virtue of temperance, as well as fortitude. Fortitude, which strengthens us to suffer unwanted sorrows through a more ascetical use of the internet. And so the notion of fasting from the internet during Lent or of monitoring and rationing our use of online time, I know some parents who do this for their kids, these are all very good things to do. Or perhaps taking a break and seeking silence and beauty in prayer. In your workspaces, or many of you people who are working from home, you know, working from home is good if it means that we can actually take a break from our work in order to pray, in order to find silence. It can be a short bit of prayer, like the tradition of saying the Angelus at set times, you know, forcing ourselves to break from work is a very important thing. And sometimes the monks have learned so that even the out in the fields, when the bell rings for prayer, they down their tools and off they go. Okay. So this is the sort of thing we want to try and foster. Our churches should be places of silence and beauty as well, so that when people get away from their homes and their workplaces and come to church, let they, let's just say for lunchtime mass, they should find silence. Certi Lange, uh, the Dominican says that mortification of the senses, mortification of the senses is necessary for thought. Now, if the scientific research is correct to say that our brains have been overstimulated by the internet and its distractions, then mortification and austerity will reduce the stimulation and give us the clarity and space that we need for deep thought. And you know that science also shows that before you go to sleep, they tell you to you know, turn off the blue lights and 
un un unhook your phones and all the rest of it, because we need that separation, that hour or so uh, away from all this stimulation before we can actually sleep and sleep well. There's also a lot of evidence, which I won't go into now, of how we're a sleep-starved society. And a sleep-starved society leads to all kinds of mental health issues, uh, which has you know, much wider implications for us all. So, in our Christian tradition then, we have the resources, pausing for prayer several times a day, just as the monks do. Seven times a day I will praise you, says the psalmist. And this monastic tradition of pausing for prayer reminds us then to turn to God and recall that God is the end, the goal of our Christian life, not our work, nor the demands of emails and messengers, no matter how urgent they seem to be, because they're not. Even online, Pope Benedict has called for, and I quote, attention to be paid to the various types of websites, applications, and social networks, which can help people today to find time for reflection and authentic questioning, as well as making space for silence and occasions for prayer, meditation, or sharing of the word of God. In my own experience, a beautiful photograph can be a moment of contemplative reflection for people, but it is ever more necessary, it seems to me, to step away from the desk and to pray. Prayer grounds us in the one necessary relationship with God, and so prepares us for the relationships that we might foster online. As Pope Francis says in his message this year, listening without prejudice, attentively and openly, gives rise to speaking according to God's style, nurtured by closeness, compassion, and tenderness. But if we're going to learn to speak in God's style, then we must learn to listen to God. That means that we must learn to pray. And this brings me then to Pope Francis's third point. He says that the digital world can hinder us from loving generously. Now, if we no longer have time nor the inclination to pay attention to the richness of the ideas that people put forward, if we can no longer concentrate on argumentations, then it's not surprising that what is called social communication actually fails to communicate and becomes antisocial. Hence, Pope Francis says, communication is ultimately a human rather than technological achievement. And therefore, when we communicate, even digitally, are we making a human connection? There is always a danger when interacting online that we forget the human person we're speaking to. Social media can be instrumentalized because we're intent on pushing our viewpoint or our digital content, and the persons involved can be objectified. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis provides a cogent analysis of the problem of the echo chamber polarizing effect of social media algorithms, which control the information we see and which fuels combative debate rather than promotes understanding and dialogue. As Pope Francis says in Fratelli Tutti, the media's noisy potpourri of facts and opinions is often an obstacle to dialogue since it lets everyone cling stubbornly to his or her own ideas, interests and choices with the excuse that everyone else is wrong. It becomes easier to discredit and insult opponents from the outset than to open a respectful dialogue aimed at achieving agreement on a deeper level. Now, St. Francis de Sales can help us in entering into dialogue with those who disagree with us. Perhaps because of his own youthful struggle with his temper, St. Francis de Sales understands, first of all, that we need to remain calm. Thus, the pamphlets that he wrote uh, to combat the Calvinists in his part of Switzerland at the time, they are certainly fervent, but as a polemic, their tone is ever comparatively mild, always addressed at historical and scriptural facts to establish the truth, and they never resort to ad hominem attacks. As a pastor of souls, he wrote up concerning the people of the Chablais where he worked that they were simple souls who loved God and worship him in all truth and sincerity. And so seeking the good in others, he loved them and spoke to the good he saw in them. He spoke to the good he saw in them. Seen in this light, 
communicating the truth to a world that seeks truth but cannot find it is in fact an act of mercy. Because the virtue of mercy, St. Thomas tells us, is to have heartfelt sympathy for another's distress, impelling us to succor him if we can. Now, this is only possible if we first regard the other as a friend. Because as St. Thomas says, com compassion happens through union of the affections, which is the effect of love. For since he who loves another looks upon his friend as another self, he counts his friend's hurt as his own, so he grieves for his friend's hurt as though he were hurt himself. So the question is, in our debates and dialogues with others, in the work of social communications that we do, are we directing our communications towards someone who we see as a friend, or at least as a potential friend? Do we look on others with that kind of compassion and mercy that St. Thomas Aquinas speaks about? Do we look upon them as people who are good ultimately, and we are seeking to draw out the good in them? St. Thomas, uh, St. Francis de Sales would add that we must act with gentleness and humility, which is directed towards God and our neighbor. That is how we communicate the gospel of peace and of salvation. I want to uh, sort of end uh, by citing St. Francis de Sales and his writings. Um, and this is where he, he writes in his introduction to Devout Life. He says that holy chrism, that's the chrism oil, is composed of olive oil mingled with balm, symbolizing, among other things, two virtues which shone out in our Lord and which he particularly loved and recommended. Humility perfects our relationship with God. Gentleness perfects our relationship with our neighbor. Balm, he says, always sinks to the bottom in all liquids and so represents humility. Olive oil always floats to the top and symbolizes that gentleness which rises above all things and is preeminent among the virtues, being the flower of charity. Make sure, however, that this mystical chrism composed of gentleness and humility is truly in your heart. For the devil deceives many into thinking they possess these virtues. Such people give themselves away when their outward show of gentleness and humility changes to arrogance at the slightest word of contradiction or the least insult. This wretched life is but a journey to the happy life to come. So let us not be angry with one another on the way, but travel together in gentleness and peace and friendship. Though we must constantly and courageously resist evil and correct the faults of those in our charge, we must nevertheless do so peacefully and gently. Nothing appeases an enraged elephant so much as the sight of a lamb, and nothing breaks the force of a cannonball so well as wool. And that, uh, I love that image of the enraged elephant uh, sort of stopping in his tracks when he sees this humble, gentle lamb. Um, this is an example of the beautiful, charming images that St. Francis of Sales would use. I could say a lot more about St. Francis uh, and his temperament, which was famously uh, so very gentle, so very courteous, that the Calvinists said upon his death, they said that if they were, uh, if they were the kind of church that would make saints and declare others to be saints, they said they would, they would definitely canonize St. Francis and they called him the gentleman saint. Even in his lifetime, he was called the gentleman saint because of his uh, courtesy and his uh, way of dealing with people, which is always gentle and humble. Um, I want to just end here because I'm mindful of the time. Uh, because I'm sure that you will have questions you might want to ask, um, but you'll notice that I don't want to focus so much on myself or what I've done or how I do things, but I want to look to the example of the saints, but also to how we might foster uh, the kind of environment that makes for more wisdom, for deeper thinking, and for a better life of prayer, so that out of that prayer and wisdom and deep thinking, we can actually communicate better in truth and in love to those around us. Thank you. 
So right now, let's start with the very first question. And um, Father, uh, besides Bishop Robert Barron, uh, are there any other contemporary good Catholic examples uh, of defending truth online with love? Any that you would recommend? I can think of a few. Um, I think that currently uh, our Sunday visitor um, is, is doing a good job. Um, that's OSV. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm signed up with OSV to write a book for them. But, um, but I, I just think that the editorial team uh, headed by a team of Dominicans is, is, is a good team. Um, and I think they are trying to be uh, to listen carefully on all sides as they, they communicate uh, what the church is teaching and communicate the gospel uh, to communicate good news. Um, I, I also think that Catholic Answers has I've visited Catholic Answers in San Diego, at their headquarters there. And for a very long time, Catholic Answers has been working quietly in the background, really. We've taken them for granted and we've kind of forgotten about them, but they're still, they're still there and they still give uh, a nuanced and balanced answer to the many questions that people ask about Catholic truth and what we believe. So I think they should be, they should be more of a go-to uh, resource than, than they are today. Most people go to other places, uh, but I think Catholic Answers is very good. If you're going to ask me about individuals, um, I can't think of many, um, <laughs> but I do... I do enjoy uh, the scholarship of various people who can help us to shed some light on things. Um, I'm thinking in particular of someone I follow on Twitter, but he's also a friend, personal friend of mine um, called Matthew Hazell, H-A-Z-E-L-L. -L. Um, and although he writes a lot about liturgical issues, uh, you know, he often presents evidence and he wants to have a balanced, rational, non-emotional discussion about liturgical questions. I think that's always a very good way to do things, to look at the evidence that we have. Um, yeah, I think that's, that will do for now. Thank you, Father. Um, so the next question uh, is, how do we encourage our fellow Catholics to speak with love and gentleness uh, most of the time, if not all the time? Well, the, the virtues of gentleness, humility, and so on, these obviously come from uh, close contact with our Lord. You notice what Francis de Sales says, that uh, many of us might think of ourselves as you know, humble and gentle people, but as soon as someone contradicts us, uh, we get riled up or we show our arrogance. Uh, often, uh, we react with a kind of pride because we don't like to be wrong or we don't like to be shown to be wrong. It's not about love for the truth, but actually a love for ourselves and our own sense of self-worth and dignity and our sense of pride. Um, so St. Francis does call on us to be aware of that. Um, and, and I guess I'm speaking personally, I, I've been aware that uh, sometimes online, certainly um, still today, but even before more often, I would react quite strongly and quite quite strongly in a way that's quite, um, can be off-putting. Um, I didn't like to be, to be thought to be shown to be wrong and so on. And so reading these words from St. Francis really struck me very strongly. I, I, he's one of, as I said, one of my favorite saints and one of the, uh, a great spiritual teacher, one that I will really hold up as an example for us to read and to follow. Um, and he would tell us really that, you know, gentleness and humility comes really from prayer. Uh, and, and from staying in close contact to our Lord and recognizing that he is the source of all good and of all that we have, you know, the truth that we have and the truth we want to communicate. It's not ours, so we don't have to take it personally. Uh, you know, we, we, it is Christ, it is God's, and uh, it is he who teaches us in the first place. So we must stay close to him in prayer. Um, often I find that if I start to get impatient and snappy online, uh, it's because I haven't stopped to pray and I've just been sort of harassed with work. And that's probably something we can all sort of identify with. We do need to stop and pray. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for that very uh, practical way of um, 
keeping ourselves in check. Now, um, the next question, as communicators, how can we try our best uh, to spread the good news online while ensuring that uh, we are not contributing to the darling of the mind? So how, how are we to toe this fine balance? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can give you a little example, I guess. <clears throat> so, um, you know, communicators like the, uh, I forgot to mention the pillar. Um, so the pillar, I think is a very good example of a kind of communication that tries to get to the bottom of things. And, and part of that, you know, trying to understand, uh, trying to understand the world of communications, we need to look at how human beings behave and human motivations. Okay, so recently, like in the last three days, there was a bit of a, a what do you call it, a storm in a teacup, because it said that uh, the, the the press headline said that at the coronation of King Charles on Saturday, the people of England and Scotland and Wales and everybody uh, will be invited to make a pledge of allegiance to the king, um, and or rather, no, they used the word ask. They would be asked to make a pledge of allegiance. Now it's strange, but the word ask doesn't mean ask, it means told, and is stronger than the word invite, okay? And um, this caused a lot of comment online because they said, well, you know, we've never made a pledge of allegiance to the king. This is the first time in, in history that we've been asked to do such a thing. So it's, it's ridiculous uh, and someone did some research into this about whether we were actually being asked or whether we were being invited and which press um, officer or which circle of communicators were the first ones to use the word ask in the headlines. And, and you know, so there was some very careful looking into the actual text itself, what the coronation service actually says, which is invites. Um, the commentary on the coronation service, which was given by the Archbishop of Canterbury, written all written down, also said that this is not uh, something that people must do, but if they do it, if they feel comfortable with it. But all those nuances were not communicated in the headline, you know, that people will be asked to make a Pledge of Allegiance. And that phrase asked came from, I think, the Archbishop of Canterbury's own press offices, who issued basically um, a communicator to the press um, that sort of said, oh, these are some of the features of the new things that are going to happen in the, in the coronation service this year. And one of the things they highlighted was people be asked to make a, a pledge of allegiance. So of course, if you're a lazy, uh, well, if you're a busy uh, journalist, you just take the communique from the press office and you just put in your headline, right? Um, but if they'd actually bothered to read the actual document which the communique was talking about, they would have seen not asked, but invited. So that had to be clarified and all the rest of it. And I think that um, uh, when we communicate then, it's very uh, important to uh, see the balance behind, you know, sort of give a balanced view to be, to be noticed, uh, to be attentive to nuances, nuances of meaning, and uh, to be to understand that people, when they communicate, can be a bit callous sometimes. So in this case, to communicate from the press secretary was definitely a bit callous, I would say. But that's because you know everything's happening under a lot of pressure. Everyone's in a bit of a rush. But you can see how that can cause problems. Um, another one might be more recently uh, the uh, Archbishop Paglia said something about euthanasia. And uh, he claims that he was widely misunderstood or misquoted out of context and so on and so forth. And again, it just shows that, um, you know, it's good to give people the benefit of the doubt. And we do need to look very carefully at what they say and the context in which it's said. Um, and I find that online, a lot of people don't want to read the context. They don't like nuance. They want clear, black and white, simple answers, sort of simple statements. And it isn't always possible when we're talking about issues of prudence and moral judgment. Um, it, it calls for a lot more nuance, especially because people's lives can be quite nuanced and complicated. Life isn't black and white. 
And I say that as someone who wears black and white every day, <laughs> you know, but life isn't black and white. And whilst we would like things to be simple and black and white, um, I don't think that does justice to the complexity of the issues or the complexity of people's lives. As Catholics, we must be able to kind of be sensitive to that without falling into the problem of saying nothing. Okay, and I think the choice of words, therefore, is very, very important. All right, thank you, Father. Um, so you mentioned earlier that we should take more time to think and study what we learn from the internet. Um, but in the workplace setting, say in a broadcast uh, newsroom environment where communicating news to one's audience uh, in the quickest of time, uh, that is, uh, which is important, how then is a person to reconcile the need to be silent and study and also be cognizant of the impact? So here's my question, right? Yeah. Why, is, why does speed come into this at all? Right? I mean, if what we're communicating is true, whether you've heard it 10 days from now or on the day itself, it's still true. Okay, I'm exaggerating. Obviously, you're not aiming to you know, communicate news 10 days after the event. If you're going to be news, you want to do it within a reasonable length of time. But the 24-7 news cycle that we see, or sort of news, um, I think it's called a news cycle, um, the way we see it is, is people feel the need to comment on the spot all the time on everything. And I think that's dumb. And it's sinfully wrong. Why? So my question is, why do we have to do this? You know, if, you're, if your work situation is like this and it's a Catholic environment, you should turn around and say to your boss, why are we doing this? What is the goal? The goal is not to be for everyone to see, oh, look, they broke the news, because th that's not really what's important. I would much rather you take your time to break the news, but make sure you break it in a way that's, that's, you know, that's truthful, that's balanced, that's nuanced. You know, if I'm going to make an omelet, I can, you've got to take time. You can't just break the eggs because you're always going to get end up with scrambled eggs and a mess. Sure, I was the first to produce you produce you uh, food with eggs on it, but it's not it's not a beautiful omelet or even a quiche. I'm going to make quiche after this, so I'm thinking of quiche now. Thank you, Father. So um, the next question is: Should we encourage uh, intellectual studiousness among our less privileged friends or senior family members who are pious uh, but yet lack a bit in in criticality? And if so, uh, is there a loving way to do? Um, this? Um, oh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> privilege and age have nothing to do with our human rational capacities. The human being is made for the intellectual life. Uh, the human being uniquely is a rational creature. Um, you know, so we should use our intellects uh, and learn to enjoy it as well. St. Thomas does say that um, because of our bodily natures, we also tend to, to enjoy study or hard intellectual work. This is something that he knows, and he's, he's, he's clear about that. Nevertheless, that the Catholic Church, until very recently, has never shied away from teaching hard truths and, this, and just plugging away at it. Um, and, I, if, you know, you can look at some of the older catechisms that were around in the 1950s, and see how some very complex truths and philosophical ideas were being taught to kids in school uh, through the Baltimore Catechism or the St. Joseph Catechism. Uh, but they taught it using comics, they used images, they used all kinds of things, just as St. Francis de Sales uses the image of the enraged elephant. You know, it's often, it's not so much um, the difficulty or the complexity of what we're communicating, that's the problem, but how we communicate it. And it certainly is possible and we shouldn't shy away from it. As for encouraging people to, um, to think, <laughs> um, I'm reminded of a Dominican student master who used to say to his students, he says, I don't care what you think, but for God's sake, think. Um, I think that often uh, in my communications with, with people I know, I often try and get them to think about the nuances and to think about the question, the, the sort of just to be logical about how we look at things. It's not easy. Um, I, as promoted general of the rosary, 
uh, I've given a number of talks where I'm always asked all kinds of questions, which I think are pious and well-meaning, but they're not well thought out in terms of the implications of what they're suggesting we should do. And so I try and point it out to them um, as, as kindly as possible and as patiently as possible, probably not as patiently as I, I should do, but, but I do try. Okay, just one last question, Father. Um, how can we use um, chat GPT and, and similar AI um, technology uh, ethically to benefit society today? Um, that's probably not a question I can answer because I haven't really used chat GPT myself, um, partly because you have to pay for the service, I believe. So I've, I've actually signed up for the, the free Google uh, uh, AI chatbot, um, but I haven't had the time, it's called Bard, I think. I haven't had much time to use it, but I wasn't too impressed by what I did. So um, I haven't had time to think about it much. Um, so this is an example of me not wanting to give a, an answer just because I want to look clever, because I haven't actually given it much thought. What I do have in my mind is what I, read about yesterday. Uh, as I said, AI is presenting new challenges, and these challenges are coming at us much more swiftly than anybody, including the inventors of all this, actually imagined. And ChatGPT has been especially in particular singled out um, by governments as something that we need to legislate against and define control. Um, and I'm not meaning the government of China. <laughs> I mean, uh, Western democracies as well. So uh, this is something that is pretty critical. And uh, I would say that people have to be, I mean, the, the inventors said that, oh, they created these things to take care of drudgery or drudge work, uh, but they never foresaw uh, that it would be used to, you know, write your essays. <laughs> uh, and do, or even do your job. You know, I, I someone told me that um, a journalist who lives near me said that someone had asked a chat GPT to write an article in his style. He's, he's a you know published journalist. And he said that when he read it, he was shocked that even he reading it, he had to think himself, did I write this at some point? <laughs> you know, so it is quite shocking uh, and quite scary at how powerful these artificial intelligence can be. Um, I think there are more, there are very important moral questions to ask about why it's objectionable and why, uh, you know, leaving aside the fact that if I get a, a robot to, to write the question, uh, write an, answer, an essay for me, it means that it's not really my work uh, and I haven't given it any thought and I've not learned anything. But leaving all that aside, um, what about artificial intelligence, uh, AI generated art, for example? Um, why is it wrong, or why do we need to say they're AI generated, um, and why are we uncomfortable about it? It can't be just an emotional feeling, I don't feel comfortable about this. There must be some rational reasons. So um, I'm sure the philosophers are thinking hard and working on this. Um, personally, again, my, I asked the final questions which are the questions I asked right at the beginning. What is knowledge for? What is truth for and what is goodness and beauty for? They are to enable the human being to come to know the creator who is the source of all good. If we look at you know, machines and that includes AI generated things have always just been instruments. They are means to an end. But the end that they seek isn't the end that the human being seeks. The human being seeks, properly speaking, the human being seeks the end, which is the attitude that's final happiness with God, which is relational. It's about that loving relationship with God. That is what the human being longs for, and what the human being seeks. Machines don't seek that end. They seek ends such as uh, enabling us to find a job and make money. Uh, they seek ends such as um, just entertaining us. Uh, but what are those for? For what reason do we have money? For what reason do we have jobs? For what reason are we entertained? And like I asked you earlier, 
for what reason do we say we have to do this all very quickly and produce these newspapers or whatever it is, the press copy? For what reason? But what end does it serve? If it doesn't actually move us to increase in love for God and in compassion and love for one another, then perhaps we don't need it after all. And I don't think that's a question anyone's asking or enough people are asking. Why do we need these things? I'm going to end with, with a prayer taken from uh, Pope Francis's message for World Communications Day this year. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord Jesus, the pure word, poured out from the heart of the Father, help us to make our communication clear, open, and heartfelt. May the Lord Jesus, the word made flesh, help us listen to the beating of hearts, to rediscover ourselves as brothers and sisters, and to disarm the hostility that divides. And may the Lord Jesus, the word of truth and love, help us to speak the, word, the truth in charity so that we may feel like protectors of one another. We ask all this in his most precious name. Amen. May the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Um, amen. So thank you, Father Lawrence, as well as uh, our dear sisters and brothers in Christ. We thank you for your time. Um, before we go, we want to thank uh, the Lord for his blessings and his goodness upon all of us, and also for blessing us with Father Lawrence Liu tonight. So thank you. God bless and Jesus loves you.